The Old Testament reading for the first Sunday in Abbott is from Jeremiah chapter 23. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his day, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they shall no longer say, As the Lord lives, who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives, who brought up and led offsprings of the house of Israel, out of the north country and out of all countries where he had driven them. Then they shall dwell in their own land. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. None who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Epistle is from Romans chapter 13. Besides, this you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensual sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. When they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put, their, and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This is the gospel of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please be seated. Well, Christmas is only 27 days away. Are you ready? No, you're not. None of us are ready for Christmas because who would be 27 days out? Even in a year without pandemics and state lockdowns, who's ready for Christmas this early? A few die-hard Christmas fans, maybe. But I would venture to guess that most of us aren't, and that's okay. Doing things properly takes time. And the church has time. And that means you, a Christian, that you have time. The first Sunday of Advent does not immediately jump into the Christmas spirit. The word Advent means coming. As we heard last week on the last Sunday of the church year, of the wise and foolish virgins, we are to keep our lamps ready with oil enough and more to withstand the onslaught of the night as we are in these last days awaiting Jesus' return with joy. 
And that idea carries over to today into this new church year. To, as we await the Lord Jesus to return, to return in majesty. Remember what the angel said to the, to the disciples on the Mount of the Ascension. This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Jesus will come in majesty on the last day, and we wait and pray for his quick and speedy return to take us from this valley of sorrows to himself in heaven. That is what Advent is about. So it's no mistake today that we heard the account of Palm Sunday at the end of November. Jesus' Advent, Jesus' coming, is near. And Jesus comes to us in three ways. He will come in majesty. He does come in mystery. And he has come in history. So are you ready? Are you prepared to meet him who will come again on the last day? We'd like to think that we are. But in this challenging year, our selfishness has been laid bare for all to see. On both sides of all the issues that face us today, everyone has had their feathers ruffled and everyone is in a tizzy. Instead of putting the best construction on things, we put the worst constructions on things and on so many people. And all the while, our regular sins of our sinful flesh are always there, committing heinous acts of idolatry, fearing not the true God of heaven and earth, but fearing those who think and who do differently than we do. We are so grossly unprepared for Jesus' return. But Advent helps us prepare. Advent helps us to examine our hearts and our minds to see how we have sinned in thought, word, and deed by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. We are not ready without the preparations being made of having our sins laid bare by the law. The simple way for us to examine ourselves is to ask what Luther writes in the small catechism. Consider your place in life according to the, to the Ten Commandments. Are you a father, mother, son, daughter, husband, wife, or worker? Have you been disobedient, unfaithful, or lazy? Have you been hot-tempered, rude, or quarrelsome? Have you hurt someone by your own words or deeds? Have you stolen, been negligent, wasted anything, or done any harm? So consider your station in life according to the Ten Commandments. And how have you sinned? And how has your sin made known to you by the Ten Commandments? As a husband or a father, have you neglected to be the head of your house, to lead your wife and children in the ways of God? Have you neglected to teach your children the scriptures and the catechism or become passive in bringing your family to church and thereby setting a poor example of Christian freedom and duty? As a wife or a mother, as God's helper to your husband, have you failed to help him in raising God-fearing children and perhaps placed your career or other things before those whom God has given to you? Or children, have you angered or disobeyed your parents? Have any of us spoken ill of those in authority over us? For those of you who work, 
or have worked? Have you been lazy? Have you been a busybody, only appearing to be busy at the task given you to fulfill? As a member of this congregation, have you been lazy in attending worship here or even online? And what about Bible study? What about your prayers? What about on hearing the scriptures outside of the divine service? And what of the divine service itself and receiving the body and blood of Jesus? And how about the ways that you've dealt with others, with your neighbors, with your family, with your friends, and even with your fellow believers in Christ? Let me count the ways. We are not ready at all. When I was growing up, I remember a banner that would come out every Advent. And on that banner was written the words, prepare your hearts. The gift is big. How do you get ready? How do you prepare yourself for Christ who will come again in majesty, who does come in mystery, and who has come in history? Well, the answer's simple, but it's not easy. You prepare for Jesus' return in majesty the same way you prepare for his coming in mystery and history. Think about it. Jesus comes to you now in mystery, in his word and sacrament, at pulpit, altar, and font. And how does the divine service begin? With confession. You confess your sins and you are absolved for the sake of Jesus. And then, only then, does the pastor dare to enter into the chancel, the, whole, the most holy place. And then, only does he do that with the Psalms on his lips. As you ready yourself for the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, to be read to you, you stand in preparation. But why? Why do you stand for the gospel? Because as the holy gospel is read, Jesus is in your midst. And when God is present, the body responds. And before Jesus joins himself to the bread and wine upon the altar, you're told, lift up your hearts. To lift up your stone, heart of stone. That he would replace it with a heart of flesh. And be given life in this blessed sacrament. And still more, all people are invited to come to the font to become as little children in the waters of holy baptism and there by water and the word be buried with Jesus and raised with him to new life. That is how you prepare for Jesus who comes to you today in mystery. And you prepare for him who came in history each year as we celebrate the birth of the Messiah born of the Virgin Mary and laid in a manger. Not with Christmas cookies and trees and lights and everything else that we think has to do with Christmas. But we prepare our hearts and our minds in the same way. By confessing our sins, by lifting up our cold hearts of stone to be forgiven by the God-man who humbles himself even to the point of death upon a cross. So really, it's not you who are doing any of the preparations. It's the Holy Spirit. Remember the parable of the fig tree? Where the man dug around it and put on manure so that it would be fruitful and grow? That's us. 
That's the work of the Holy Spirit, that we might be fruitful. He works by his law and the preaching of that law that you are hearing to work in you the knowledge of your sin and leads you to repent, to forsake your sins, those hostile thoughts and deeds that you have towards God and towards each other so that you would not put the worst construction on everything but the best construction on everything. The Holy Spirit sends you pastors to speak his word of law that you would repent and then the word of forgiveness. And by the authority of Jesus, you are forgiven with those words that place you back into your baptism. Jesus comes today in mystery. Just as Jesus came on Palm Sunday, he comes not riding even a donkey, but he comes to you humbly through human words and through earthly bread and wine. Your sin is made known to you. Your sin is laid bare and you confess your sins, acknowledging what the Scripture says of you. And the sweet balm of the Gospel is given to soothe your stricken conscience. And your weeping is turned into laughter, your sorrow into joy. And those cries of Hosanna from Palm Sunday, that Hebrew word that means save us now, that same word is upon our lips today. That Jesus would return quickly in majesty and save us. That he would judge the living and the dead. That he would deliver us from this valley of sorrows that we might meet him with joy. And he does save us now. He brings to us the fruits of his cross that we would be prepared for his return. That our lamps would be supplied with oil enough and more. That when he comes to be our judge, it would be for our deliverance and eternal joy. Even in the midst of everything that's gone on this year, everything that's happened, how the world tries to, to destroy the church, to destroy the faithful, to silence those who would confess Christ. We remember these words from the hymn, Though hosts against us stand arrayed, Christ bids us still, be not afraid. Though all its powers the truth assail, the gates of hell shall not prevail. O Lord, whose mercies still endure, preserve to us thy gospel pure. Let it alone within us reign, that thine the glory may remain. In the name of Jesus, amen. The peace of God which surpasses understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.